Waco, Texas, a place known for a lot of different things. The birthplace of Dr. Pepper, home of the Texas Sports Hall of Fame, as well as sadly, one of the most tragic incidents in American religious history, masterminded by a maniacal cult leader. Something the city is definitely not known for is producing musical superstars. But it happened when R&B group High Five came on the scene. The group, formed in 1989, consisted of original members Tony Thompson Jr., Roderick Poo Clark, Marcus Sanders, Russell Neal, and Oklahoma City, Oklahoma native Toriano Easley. Tony, Poo, Marcus, and Russell all grew up together in Waco, approximately 100 miles south of Dallas. Tony's mother discovered her little boy had some real talent after hearing him sing in church as a member of the youth choir. He also participated in local talent shows. Another older up and coming musician that Tony would run into at these shows was William Walton. Little did Tony know how much of an integral role William would play in helping to make his dreams come true. Later, when William connected with a couple of music managers out in New York, Vincent Vinnie Bell and Robert Ford, they told him that they were trying to find a young kid who could sing and possibly be the next Michael Jackson. Of course, William knew just the kid who could easily fill those shoes. The moment the managers heard Tony sing, they knew they'd found what they were looking for. Now, with Tony as the focal point, the next step was finding some other youngsters to complete a group. Tony himself suggested his friend from Oklahoma, Toriano. Later, three other neighborhood boys, Russell, Pooh, and Marcus, came on board, thereby completing the quintet. The Playmates, as they were now called, secured a management deal with Vinnie and Robert, and they in turn secured the guys a deal with Jive Records. Before things could get going though, a name change was in order. As it turned out, Hugh Hefner owned the name Playmates, so that wasn't going to fly. High Five, a gesture of celebration that they often did with one another, seemed perfect. Then it was off to New York to meet with superstar R&B hip hop and New Jack swing producer, Teddy Riley. High Five burst onto the music scene in 1990 with their debut track, I Just Can't Handle It. It shot all the way to number three on the R&B hip hop songs chart. In the group's unsung episode, they told the story of how excited they all were to hear the song on the radio for the first time while driving home from rehearsal. Everyone that is, except Toriano. He was locked up. While visiting his hometown of Oklahoma City, he got into a physical altercation with a person he was acquainted with. According to Toriano, in the midst of the scuffle which he believed to be just a fist fight, Toriano pulled out the firearm he'd been carrying to pass it off to his friend and resume the role. As he did that, the guy he was fighting hit him and grabbed for the peas. The next thing they knew, it went off, hitting the guy in the stomach. Toriano, who was just 16 at the time of the incident, was charged with first degree murder. He later pled guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to 10 years behind bars. He would serve six and a half. With Toriano out of commission, High Five wasn't going to work with four members, so a search began for a replacement. Enter Bronx High School student Tristan Irby. High Five's debut album dropped in September 1990. It included the singles I Just Can't Handle It, I Can't Wait Another Minute, and their number one pop and number one R&B hit, I Like The Way, The Kissing Game. I Can't Wait Another Minute also became a number one R&B hit. The group's second album, Keep It Going On, was released two years later. Even though it wasn't as successful as their debut effort, several tracks from the project, including She's Playing Hard To Get and Quality Time, did become top five R&B hits. With all the success the group was experiencing, it was no surprise that they started to feel themselves a little bit, were getting tired of all the restrictions placed on them because of their age, and wanted more freedom. To them, that meant getting rid of Vinnie and Robert. High Five ended up giving their positions to their road manager. Their record label, Jive, would be the next people to feel the group's wrath. The guys were well aware of the number of records they were selling, so they didn't understand where all the money was going. To grab the label's attention, Russell came up with the idea that the group shouldn't participate in the promotional tour the label had set up to advertise their latest album until they were able to meet with the powers that be to go over the numbers. The other members didn't go for it, but Russell stuck to his guns. The result was Russell not being a part of the video shoot for the album's lead single, She's Playing Hard to Get. Eagle Eye fans will notice that in some of the group shots, there are only four people, while in other dance shots, the strategic placement of their choreographer makes it look like he is the fifth member. Alas, yet another major catastrophe was about to wreak havoc on High Five's journey. One day, as the group was motoring down the road, the van they were in crashed and rolled over on top of another vehicle. Everyone was able to exit the van, except Pooh. 
He couldn't as he was unable to feel his legs. Later, it was confirmed that he was paralyzed from the chest down and would never walk again. One thing Pooh could do was reach out to Russell, which he did, asking him to come back to the group so they could carry on. Russell honored the request. If Russell thought, since the other guys welcomed him back in the fold, that meant that everything was kosher between them, he needed to think again. While in the process of working on their next project, High Five was weighing their options with other labels, as their tenure at Jive was coming to an end. Ultimately, they accepted a deal with Giant Records, and in turn received a hefty signing bonus of $60,000 apiece. The other three members, though, felt that Russell didn't deserve all of his share because of his previous absence. After relaying their plan to Russell to hold back some of his money, he decided to leave the group for good. High Five went into recruitment mode again to bring the group from a trio back to a quintet with the addition of Shannon Gill and Terrence Murphy. Released in October 1993 and serving as the group's final project required to move on from Jive, High Five emerged with their third album titled Faithful. It featured the songs Unconditional Love and Never Should Have Let You Go, the latter of which would end up as the group's last top 30 pop hit and top 10 R&B hit. The guys quickly realized though that the great deal that they thought they had struck with Giant wasn't turning out to be so. In reality, the label really wanted to focus their energy on Tony and not High Five. Eventually, an agreement was made to do a solo Tony Thompson album as well as a High Five album, with Tony's project coming out first. As Tony went into the studio to begin work on his project, the rest of the guys found themselves just sitting around twiddling their thumbs. When it was all said and done, Giant never did end up releasing a High Five album. Tony, though, did release his. Sexational dropped in the summer of 1995 and spawned two singles, one of which, the baby face penned, I Wanna Love Like That, became a top 20 R&B hit. That one victory wouldn't be enough to keep the label happy though, so they dropped him. In the group's unsung episode, it was revealed that Tony had an addiction to cocaine that no one knew about, and the other members did their best to conceal it from everyone, including their record company. His habit also caused him to mess up a deal he'd signed with Diddy's bad boy label. Tony would then disappear for a while, but reappear again years later as part of High Five. But not the High Five everyone had come to know and love. In 2005, he, along with Terrence Murphy and three never seen before members, created a new version using the old name and released an album. When the original members got wind of things, they didn't get angry, they got lawyers. Russell, Marcus, and Tristan got a court injunction to stop sales of the album for improper use of the group's name. A couple of years later, things had smoothed out between Tony, Marcus, and Tristan so much that they began thinking of giving High Five another go. They even got back in touch with Vinny, their old manager, to bring him back on board as well. Everyone was ready and excited for what they hoped would be an epic comeback. Unfortunately, it would never come to fruition. On June 1st, 2007, Tony's body was discovered by security officers at around 10 o'clock at night near an air conditioning unit outside of an apartment complex in Waco. A coroner's report later stated that he died from inhaling a toxic amount of Freon. Traces of methadone were also found in his system. He was 31 years old. Four years later, Tristan released his first solo effort, a single called Everything. He told You Know I Got Soul.com he knew it was time to get back to making music again the day he woke up in a hospital after getting shot five times two years prior. The incident happened outside a New Haven, Connecticut nightclub and appeared to be a random act. The very next year, to honor Tony's last wish to have the group continue their legacy, Tristan, Marcus, and Shannon reformed High Five with two new members, Andre Ramsor, also known as Dre Wanda, and Farouk Evans. According to Marcus, they did approach the other former members to reunite as well. Terrence Murphy declined, instead opting to team up with Toriano Easley on a project with High Five's original managers. That same year, High Five released their first single in nearly two decades called Favorite Girl. Over the years, nothing much was heard from Russell. When his name did begin to trend again, it would be for all the wrong reasons. On July 2nd, 2014, the 40-year-old walked into a county sheriff's office in Houston to report that his wife, 24-year-old Catherine Martinez, was deceased in their home. After authorities arrived on the scene, it was discovered that she'd been stabbed numerous times. Catherine's family said that they immediately believed Russell was to blame, since he'd been physically abusive towards her throughout their relationship. Police even say he confessed. 
She was also forced into the position of being the breadwinner for the family, which included two children, because Russell was broke. He was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. He did bond out at the time, but two months later, the bond was revoked after Russell told his bail bondsman that he would no longer answer to his given name and prefers to be called his new name, Jesus Christ. After one year of treatment at an inpatient psychiatric hospital, the court found Russell to be mentally ill and incompetent to stand trial. Prosecutors, though, refused to drop the charges, and Russell was ordered to continue treatment and have another competency evaluation done at a later date. In an unbelievable twist concerning the Neal family, in 2009, Russell's younger brother Ronald also took the life of his wife after years of abuse toward her. The tragedy also happened on the same day she filed for divorce. Ronald was ultimately sentenced to 80 years in prison. Oddly, all these years later, there still doesn't appear to be a final verdict on Russell's case. High Five finally fulfilled what they set out to do back in 2007 when they dropped a brand new album appropriately titled Legacy in 2017. Sadly, on April 17, 2022, former member Roderick Pooh Clark passed away at the age of 49. According to a report from TMZ, the cause of death appears to be complications from an infection and pneumonia. Currently, High Five, consisting of members Marcus, Tristan, Shannon, Farouk, and newest member and Farouk's cousin, Billy Covington, continue to tour and delight audiences with their hits that not only made their indelible mark on the 90s R&B scene, but continue to be loved by fans today.